Hello, I'm Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and today in this ongoing video series on an approach to symptoms, I'll be discussing an approach to dysphagia. I'm going to start with a few terms. First is dysphagia itself, which refers to the symptom of difficulty swallowing. Dysphagia needs to be differentiated from odynophagia, which is painful swallowing. These two symptoms have overlapping lists of etiologies and can coexist, but they often don't. There's also a symptom called globus pharyngeus, which refers to a fullness or a sensation like there's a foreign body within the throat or esophagus, but without an overt anatomic explanation like food impaction, and typically without accompanying dysphagia. True dysphagia can be subdivided into oral pharyngeal versus esophageal dysphagia. In oral pharyngeal dysphagia, the patient experiences difficulty moving food and or liquid from the mouth into the esophagus, whereas in esophageal dysphagia, the patient experiences difficulty moving food and or liquid from the esophagus into the stomach. The distinction is important because these two subtypes have completely different lists of etiologies and therefore different workups. Etiologies of oral pharyngeal dysphagia can be subdivided into neurologic, myopathic, and other. Neurologic etiologies include stroke, any form of dementia, Parkinson's disease, ALS, multiple sclerosis, or any lesion in the brainstem such as a malignancy. Myopathic etiologies include myosthenia gravis and inflammatory myopathies such as polymyositis. Etiologies in the other category include something called a Zenker's diverticulum, which is an outpouching of mucosa at the junction of the posterior pharynx and upper esophagus, just proximal to the upper esophageal sphincter. A variety of oral pharyngeal tumors can lead to dysphagia. Dry mouth, known more formally as xerostomia, which can be a symptom of an autoimmune disease, a medication side effect, or be idiopathic. Mucositis, which is inflammation of the mucous membranes of the mouth, which can occur during chemotherapy or radiation treatment. And oral pharyngeal dysphagia can be a chronic complication of either radiation therapy or surgery within the oral cavity or pharynx. Moving to the etiologies of esophageal dysphagia, we can subdivide these into structural pathologies that are intrinsic to the esophagus, those extrinsic to the esophagus, and a separate category for motility disorders. Intrinsic causes include food impaction or a foreign body. Both of these present acutely and are the only causes of dysphagia in this framework that are commonly medical emergencies. Reflux esophagitis and GERD can cause dysphagia. Eosinophilic esophagitis is an immune-mediated condition of incompletely understood pathogenesis characterized by eosinophil-predominant inflammation. Esophageal strictures, which can be the delayed result of ingestion of a caustic substance. Esophageal rings and webs. Esophageal cancer is an important etiology. And last is infectious esophagitis, such as that caused by HSV in Canada. Unlike many other etiologies in this framework, Infectious esophagitis usually presents with significant odynophagia in addition to dysphagia. In the extrinsic category are the pathologies which cause dysphagia by compressing the esophagus from the outside. This includes mediastinal masses such as tumors or massive lymphadenopathy, aortic aneurysms, and something called a vascular ring, which is a congenital abnormality in which one or more great vessels completely surrounds either the trachea or esophagus or most commonly both. Depending on the severity of the compression, these can present within the first several weeks of life or be asymptomatic into adulthood. Within the last category for motility, the most well-known disorder here is echolasia. This is a condition of unknown pathogenesis in which there is a loss of normal peristalsis in the distal esophagus and the lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax after swallowing. Other motility disorders include diffuse esophageal spasms and something called nutcracker or jackhammer esophagus. These are similar diseases in which esophageal contractions are excessive. Chagas disease is an infectious disease caused by a parasite found in Central and South America. It causes a wide variety of complications, including pathologies of the esophagus. And last, an autoimmune disease called systemic sclerosis, also known as scleroderma, can cause a loss of normal peristalsis. Notably, systemic sclerosis can also less commonly cause oral pharyngeal dysphagia 
and reflux esophagitis. Overall, the common causes of dysphagia are neurologic diseases of stroke, dementia, and Parkinson's, leading to oral pharyngeal dysphagia, and food impaction and reflux esophagitis, causing esophageal dysphagia. How do we evaluate dysphagia? Starting with the history, the first task is to determine whether the patient is experiencing true dysphagia versus odynophagia versus both. Ask about the duration and pattern of dysphagia. Dysphagia that had a very abrupt onset is consistent with a stroke or food impaction. Is the dysphagia consistently present at every meal or only sometimes? Intermittent dysphagia is more often described with diffuse esophageal spasm, webs and rings, and eosinophilic esophagitis. And does the dysphagia only occur when trying to swallow solid food, or does it affect solids and liquids equally? Dysphagia that affects solids and liquids equally is suggestive of a neurologic or motility disorder, while dysphagia that predominantly affects solids is suggestive of either intraluminal obstruction or external compression. Does the patient have associated symptoms? Heartburn suggests GERD and reflux esophagitis, while any cause of dysphagia, if severe enough, can cause weight loss, the more significant the weight loss has been, the more concerned about an underlying malignancy you should be. Vomiting and vertigo can be seen in brainstem lesions. Coughing, particularly coughing during meals, is suggestive of an oral pharyngeal cause. Changes in speech, including hoarseness, can be due to either concurrent neurologic disease, such as Parkinson's, laryngeal disease, or mediastinal pathology. Halitosis, which is the medical term for bad breath, is a classic symptom of a Zanker's diverticulum. And dry eyes can be a symptom of an autoimmune disease called Sjogren's syndrome, which also causes dry mouth. In the past medical history, be sure to specifically ask about any neurologic or autoimmune disease, recurrent pneumonia and or aspiration, radiation therapy, or caustic ingestion. And of course, any oral neck or thoracic surgery is very relevant. With a physical exam, after vitals, the patient warrants an inspection of the oral cavity and a lymph node exam for any evidence of infection or malignancy. A focused abdominal exam, including palpation of the epigastric region, might rarely identify relevant pathology. Cardiac auscultation could reveal a murmur consistent with a vascular anomaly. But in general, the most important part of the physical exam for a patient presenting with dysphagia is a thorough neuro exam. Commonly ordered tests in the evaluation of dysphagia include something called a videofluoroscopic modified barium swallow test, more colloquially known as a videofluoroscopic swallow study. In this test, instead of a series of x-rays taken in one position, as would be the case with a conventional barium swallow study, a series of videos are taken, often with a patient in more than one position, and sometimes with a patient drinking barium contrast of different consistencies. Other tests include nasopharyngoscopy, in which the posterior pharynx and larynx are directly visualized. This can help identify malignancy and may see evidence of a Zanker's diverticulum. This test is often done as part of a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, or FEES, in which the patient swallows while their posterior pharynx and larynx are being visualized with the endoscope. An esophagogastroduodenoscopy, or EGD, is a key part of the evaluation of any patient whose dysphagia appears esophageal in origin. In this test, a flexible tube is inserted into the mouth through the upper esophageal sphincter of a sedated patient to directly visualize the interior of the esophagus and stomach. Biopsies can be taken of any visualized pathology, and some pathologies, such as a stricture or esophageal ring, can be potentially treated at the same time. Other tests occasionally ordered include a conventional barium swallow, esophageal manometry, which can help identify motility disorders, and a CT chest, which can identify mediastinal masses. The first two of these six tests are primarily for evaluating oral pharyngeal dysphagia, while the last four are primarily for evaluating esophageal dysphagia. Now, how do we apply all this information to create an approach to diagnosis? The first step in such an algorithm is to use history to distinguish probable oral pharyngeal dysphagia from probable esophageal dysphagia. Oral pharyngeal dysphagia is suggested 
by difficulty initiating a swallow, meaning the dysphagia is immediate. If the patient reports drooling or spillage of food out of their mouth, a cough or choking sensation. If the patient requires repeated swallows to clear all the food out of their pharynx. And if the patient has a history of pre-existing neurologic or myopathic pathology. On the other hand, features that suggest probable esophageal dysphagia include a delay of several seconds between the initiation of a swallow and the dysphagia sensation, the presence of odynophagia, which is relatively uncommon in oral pharyngeal etiologies, with the exception of mucositis, a sensation of food getting stuck in the chest specifically suggests an esophageal cause when patients point to their sternum as a location from which the sensation appears to arise, and of course a history of pre-existing esophageal pathology. History can provide further clues in the case of esophageal dysphagia. If there is dysphagia only from solid foods, it suggests a mechanical obstruction, versus a similar degree of dysphagia from solids and liquids alike, that suggests a motility disorder. From here, the algorithm diverges based on whether we suspect oral pharyngeal or esophageal pathology. In suspected oral pharyngeal dysphagia, if a specific diagnosis is strongly suspected, for example, a neurologic disease based on the neural exam, then continue with a focused workup as appropriate. Otherwise, if a structural etiology is felt to be most likely, including malignancy, the next step is typically nasopharyngoscopy with or without endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. If a neuropathic or myopathic etiology is felt most likely, then a videofluoroscopic modified barium swallow is typically done first. If whichever of those two that's done is either normal or non-diagnostic, it's usually followed by the other. If the nasopharyngoscopy shows a visible abnormality, biopsy will usually provide the diagnosis. If the videofluoroscopic swallow study suggests pathology of the upper esophageal sphincter, this is usually further evaluated with manometry, which directly measures the sphincter's pressure. If instead of suspected oral pharyngeal dysphagia, you suspect esophageal dysphagia, the first decision point is the same. If there is a specific diagnosis strongly suggested, proceed with a focused workup as appropriate. For everyone else, the most common next step is an EGD. However, there are several alternatives that are occasionally considered. For patients under the age of 50 who have no red flags for serious pathology, sometimes they are first given a four-week trial of a proton pump inhibitor as empiric treatment for reflux esophagitis, only followed by an EGD if the dysphagia is persistent. What are some red flags for serious esophageal pathology? Weight loss, immunocompromise, and the presence of either lymph adenopathy or palpable epigastric mass on exam. Another alternative path is starting with a conventional barium swallow test in patients with known upper esophageal pathology, such as a history of proximal stricture, with the thought being that having a better idea of the nature of the underlying pathology might reduce the risk of accidental esophageal perforation during the EGD. Among patients who receive an EGD, there are four possible outcomes. If there is an intrinsic abnormality seen of the esophagus, a biopsy is taken and a diagnosis is almost always made. Alternatively, if the EGD is normal and the patient has dysphagia just to solids, the next step is a barium swallow which can identify intrinsic pathologies that are missed on EGD. On the other hand, if either the EGD or barium swallow suggests extrinsic compression, it should be followed by a CT of the chest to look for a mediastinal mass and vascular abnormalities. And if the barium swallow or CT chest are done and are normal, or if the EGD was normal in a patient with dysphagia to solids and liquids, this is all suggesting a motility disorder, which usually requires esophageal manometry for diagnosis. If manometry is normal, one can consider a diagnostic category called functional dysphagia, which basically means dysphagia in the absence of any demonstrable pathology, versus a CT of the chest if not already done, as EGDs and barium swallows are not optimally sensitive for detecting the presence of extrinsic compression. As you might have noticed, this algorithm is not quite as neat and streamlined as most others in this video series, suggesting that there is room for significant variability 
and the approach taken to an individual patient in practice. Finally, a complete negative workup for either oral pharyngeal or esophageal dysphagia should prompt an evaluation of the other pathway as the patient's medical history is not perfect for distinguishing these two categories in the first place. The key takeaway points for this video. Dysphagia refers to difficulty swallowing and needs to be distinguished from odynophagia, which is painful swallowing. Dysphagia can be subdivided into two large categories. Oral pharyngeal dysphagia is difficulty moving food or liquid from the mouth into the esophagus. It is most commonly due to primary neurologic causes, such as stroke or dementia. Esophageal dysphagia is difficulty moving food or liquid from the esophagus into the stomach, most commonly due to primary diseases of the esophagus, such as GERD and food impaction. Last, although it is not a common etiology of this symptom, ruling out malignancy via nasopharyngoscopy and or EGD is a critical step in the evaluation of dysphagia. That's it for this video on an approach to dysphagia. Be sure to subscribe to Strong Medicine for more videos on how to approach symptoms, as well as a broad variety of other medical topics.